I did not get this full narrative together. And I don't feel other people are either because so many people will still make the ignorant jokes around Hotel Rwanda or use that as a reference point. They might know one cool thing that happened here, but not the narrative of this whole thing. We need to tell this story. We just meaning people, period, and people here. And how do I use my experience to be able to provide some of that for what's happening? Not to come in and take that over, but to provide platform skills and basically be able to expand and shift the narrative and being able to tell the stories of Remarkable Rwanda. Hey everyone, welcome to Flourish in the Foreign, the podcast that elevates and affirms the voices and stories of Black women living and thriving abroad. These stories also share practical tips and tricks on moving, living, and staying abroad, but also explore living abroad as a pathway to wellness. These women share their stories of how living abroad has helped them gain financial, professional, mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical wellness. If you're new to the show, welcome. Hi, I'm Christine, a Black American business strategist living and trying to thrive here in Barcelona. Flourish in the Foreign is a labor of love, but labor nonetheless. And it takes time, money, and resources to produce this podcast for you every single week. That's why I'm asking you all to please support this podcast. You can support this podcast in a number of ways. The first way you can support is by becoming a Patreon supporter of this podcast. Go to www.patreon.com slash flourish foreign and become a supporter today. Choose a tier that feels comfortable for you and enjoy the many perks of becoming a Patreon supporter today. You can also cash app the podcast at dollar sign flourish foreign. Cash app is a wonderful way to tip the podcast. If you listen to an episode and you really enjoy it, you can go ahead and cash app the podcast a couple of bucks, whatever. It's a really easy and quick way and non-committal way to support the podcast. Another way for you to support the podcast is by placing an ad for your business, product, or service within the podcast. Yes, you can do that. This podcast has surpassed 3,000 downloads already. We launched May 2020, and as of now, late August 2020, we have surpassed 3,000 downloads, y'all. So people are listening to the podcast. Now, the demographics of the podcast so far, I don't have an in-depth analysis of who listens to my podcast, but I have an inkling. I have some numbers. And the podcast is overwhelmingly listened to by women, 90%. 75% of these women identify as Black women. And a vast majority of these women are highly educated, meaning they hold two degrees or more. The vast majority of my listening audience listens from the United States. And I know that my listening audience falls into three main categories. One, people living abroad already. Two, people who have lived abroad but have returned home and are really thinking about living abroad again. And three, people who have not lived abroad but are seriously interested in living abroad. So if you have a product or service that would fit this podcast in its ethos, but also fit this audience and its demographic and what they're interested in, hit me up. Go to the website, www.flourishingleforeign.com slash contact. Go to my contact page and drop me a line and we can talk about it. On to the non-monetary ways to support this podcast. Please, please, please go ahead and subscribe to this podcast. Yes, you like it. Don't deny yourself of this joy. Go ahead and subscribe to this podcast. Go ahead and rate this podcast five stars 
and go ahead and review this podcast. If you have been listening for a while and you have not written down how much you enjoy this podcast for the whole world to hear and see and, and learn and be blessed by, yeah, you need to go ahead and do that. And if you're a new listener, go ahead and get ready to write that review because you're going to listen to this podcast. You're going to love the podcast and I'm going to need you to write that review. These reviews are super critical in the SEO algorithms and the Apple algorithms for people to find the podcast. And we want people to find the podcast. Yes, we want people to listen to these stories of Black women doing the damn thing abroad. So please write that review, rate the podcast five stars, and subscribe to the podcast. Follow the podcast at Flourish Foreign on Instagram. That's where I'm going to drop the audiograms for every episode. I also go live sometimes. I'm going to do more regularly. I keep on saying that, but y'all know it's a pandemic. So there's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of things happen. So just bear with me. But I go live there. I also share any fun news that's going on in the world of living abroad and being an expat. So I share not only news of the podcast being featured in places or if I'm being featured or speaking places, but also if there's interesting articles coming out. And that's what I really try to talk about on the IG Live is just kind of the state of Black women going abroad or anything like that. So if you really want to tap in, that's where you need to tap in. Now, if you're a Twitter person or a Facebook person, I got you follow at at Flourish Foreign. All right, that wraps up the support portion of this show. Now, on to the next story. This next story is with Autumn Marie. And although her journey abroad was a little bit unexpected, yeah, it, she hadn't really planned on living abroad, but the way she went abroad, where she's lived, and how she's really leveraged her talents and skills into serving her community while she's been abroad is just really fantastic. But I'm going to let her tell you all about it. My name is Autumn Marie. I am 38 years old and I live in Kigali, Rwanda. I'm originally from Broward, which is in the Chicago area, and had been living in New York for about 15 years. And Moved abroad from there when I was 35. I've been abroad for three years. We never took vacations that required a plane growing up. The summer vacations were often next door in Wisconsin or Indiana. My daddy is from Mississippi, and we would go down if there were family things that were happening in Mississippi. But outside of that, we really did not travel as a family. My parents were not the type of parents that were jet setting and things. So we come from a very lower working class family. We weren't traveling in that way. The first time I got on a plane, I was 13. And one of my cousins on my father's side was getting married in Atlanta. And parents weren't going or weren't able to go. One of my aunts suggested that she could take me with her. And I went along with her and I just remember being excited when we got picked up from the airport and driving up from the airport and down the expressway and just looking everywhere. And it's when they were building up for the Olympics. It was just exciting to see all those things. I think I was always just a curious person in general in terms of learning new things, period. I asked Autumn to tell me about her university years. Where did she go to school? What did she study? and how her community activism afforded her to travel. I went to University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities for my first um, year and a half. And then I transferred to Adelphi in Long Island, New York for a year and a half. Did start moving around internationally around the same time while I was still in Adelphi in New York, but more just through trips related to community organizing work that I was doing, not through school. When I was left college, I didn't graduate, just disclaimer. By the time I moved to New York and was in Adelphi, I had already taken a semester off 
um, from school in Minnesota. And none of it as just I'm taking a gap year, just to declare it was financially related and had been doing community organizing work and a lot of social justice work in Chicago, a lot of alternatives to incarceration and prison abolition stuff. When I moved to New York, I was already doing that while I was in school simultaneously. And that allowed me chances to travel a lot more, of being able to travel to conferences and activities, being able to go to Venezuela for the World Youth Conference and being able to go down to Mexico for activist work really near. And so that definitely just piqued curiosity even more of being able to see these cultures in other places. I am half Mexican, so for me, being able to go there and connect and to experience that and then just having eyes opened to just the differences and all the little intricacies from political to social, environmental, everything else that comes with just the different day-to-day life in different places, be they cities or countries. And then within those other countries, you still have all of those different socioeconomic stratospheres. Being able to experience that and that curiosity around it. I was a community organizer for a while. And then when I stepped away from that, I moved over and transitioned into PR and communications and got involved in film and music and TV, PR, communications, and still do some of that in a social cause realm as well. As I said before, Autumn's journey abroad was a little bit unexpected, meaning that it hadn't been a lifelong goal for her. However, when she met her husband, all of that changed. I never had a structured plan of wanting to move abroad and wanting to uproot everything and say, hey, I'm going to move there or these are the places I'm considering. That is not at all how my life moved. (laughs) I know that there are a lot of people who do that. It just naturally happened in my life. I met my now husband. He had lived abroad for about 12 years before we met. And when we met, got married very quickly and went back to our lives in our respective cities and we're trying to figure out where we would move together. I knew that I wanted to leave New York and I needed a breath of fresh air. I wanted sun, palm trees, and ocean. When I met him, I was already thinking about moving to LA. He had just gotten back to the States from Tanzania and for being there for 12 years. And I was thinking LA. As we were both exploring our next job options in life, and I was looking for things based there because he had lived abroad already, was just open to everything, everything globally. When he said, hey, I know you want to move somewhere with sun and palm trees, he showed me a picture of Mauritius. That's just kind of how it happened. And I think that just speaks to how, what is our paradigm and what is our mind shift? Where are our blinders on what the possibilities are in the world for those people who have not lived abroad before, have not considered it, doesn't mean that they're against it. But if that's just not how you've been moving and thinking, even if you've traveled a lot, but maybe you just have not wrapped your mind around that, you're not naturally just looking for a job abroad, even if that you want to move there someday or be open to it versus somebody who has lived in several places already. They already know the whole world is open and possibilities are limitless. I asked Autumn to describe the months and weeks and days leading up to her leaving the United States and moving abroad. Let me just give context. Things move very quickly. We literally met in October and set a first set of vows to each other in November and privately just us got married in January. So we had not figured out where we were gonna move. I was doing independent PR consulting work, still living in Harlem, in New York, and my partner was still in Cali. So I had not at all wrapped my head around what it meant to move. I had been in New York City for 15 years. I was a Brooklynite <laughs> to the bone. And, and if you have lived in probably most places, but definitely New York and Brooklyn, and you become a part of the social fabric, it is hard to leave. There is a magnet that was just, yeah, I had been saying for years I wanted to leave. That alone was a 
big thing for me to wrap my head around. And I kind of let go of that, but had not wrapped my head around what it meant to leave the U.S., to leave all these things that were familiar. And there is such a difference between traveling and staying somewhere even for a month abroad. I think he got his final confirmation in June that he had gotten a job and we were going to move. And this was not a time where everyone knew what Mauritius was. People were like, oh, you're moving to the Mauritius or the, the who, the what, my who? So you're moving to this place as well that people are not familiar with. And it was so far. I think it's a big difference than like someone who says, hey, I'm moving to Paris or even, hey, I'm moving to Spain. It's a lot geographically closer. You have one direct flight. We're moving somewhere that is going to take you a couple of flights and it's going to take you a 12 hour flight and a 10 hour flight and the layover in between. And we stayed in California at his mom's house for that last month. And probably the week before it was time to leave, that is when it got to me. And I definitely had a day where I just broke down. (laughs) What is the matter? I didn't even know what it was I needed to do. But whatever it was, I felt I had not done it. It wasn't that I wasn't spiritually ready. I just felt like it was all this stuff I needed to do. I had put my stuff in storage. I was only taking a few suitcases And I think that frazzled, it just got to me. And I had a day where I just cried and did not know what I was crying about. (laughs) I just felt there was something that was not together. When we left for the airport, there wasn't excitement. I was just open. I was just open and I left with no expectations. I had looked up a lot of stuff about Mauritius. That's the, we hadn't visited there before we moved. Um, Most people who usually do. And so, yeah, I just went with an open mind. A lot of stuff, watched videos. But again, there was a lot less stuff out even just a few years ago on Mauritius than there is now in terms of footage and things. I just went with an open mind and was really calm. But when I got off the plane in Mauritius, yeah, I just remember being, wow. And looking at the palm trees, but I was just taking in, this is where we're living. <laughs> this is our home. <laughs> this is where we are. I, for one, don't know much about Mauritius, and I was super curious to know how living on an African island would be. What is the culture like? What are the people like? And how Autumn and her husband settled in. My husband got a job working at a university, and I did not have a job. That was a whole other thing. And I know people move abroad in many different situations. A lot move with a job already secured. Some move and figure it out. Some move because of their spouse's job. And for me, I was in this new partnership because mind you, we weren't even in this partnership for a year yet. And in this new partnership, and this is our first official time living together, is moving to this place on the other side of earth. <laughs> As our like first moving together experience and first home together. And moving into this not having a job now because whole new place. That was, I think, the shakiest part was the job part because all those other new things. And he had urged, why don't you take the hiatus for a little bit? That just felt uncomfortable with all the other newness that was going on, but was also just nervous because Mauritius is highly Francophone and I speak zero French minus ballet words. Before we got there, a position in marketing opened up in the university and I was interviewing for it. But when we moved there, we're still interviewing. Moving there, it was culture shock because he would be at work and I would spend these days walking around, just getting to kind of know the neighborhood where we were in. But we were here on this island that is geographically placed within the continent of Africa, but that is heavily Indian and Indians who are speaking French. And I don't want to say isolating, but I'm a very social person. Just walking down the streets, it was not a culture in which everyone's, hey, hi, or saying that in any form, language whatsoever. It's a bit more insular, very family oriented, but very kind of insular. That was really hard on me because I'm just out walking by myself and with very extremely limited social interaction for my social butterfly self. That was probably the hardest thing early on, especially because he had a job, he was working and had this whole life and where he was being intellectually stimulated and the nerd in me had none of that. 
I, I eventually got hired and finished the interview process and began working. That made it a lot better. It's so funny because when I talk to my friends who have left New York, period, no matter whether they're living in the States, somewhere where they're getting a lot more for their money, or whether they are living in Brazil or Spain or Denmark, wherever. It is so interesting because we're just, why were we living and paying that amount of money to live? What were we doing? We say we we would go back at some point in the States, or at least for some period of time, or open to it rather. It is hard to imagine paying the amount of money for what you get after having lived in other places. In Mauritius, we had a two bedroom apartment and we're paying, I think we're paying 750, it was under 800 USD and lived across the street from the beach. We have guarded entrance and had a beautiful winding pool with the little bridges over it and a clubhouse for use, and two bathrooms, balconies, for less than $800. And there's no way possible (laughs) that you can get that in New York or Chicago. So the ease, and that was the biggest thing of not feeling. There's this hustle mentality often in New York, especially people who are working on their own. It's this grind mentality. This work hard, party hard, everything is hard. And... Living on an island, I recommend everyone does at some point in their life, even for a short time. Just the ease of it and the ease of just beautiful, laid back living. I would say food was expensive somewhat. Some of the food stuff was in Mauritius and some of that is because it is an island that is far away from mainland. It's out there in the middle of the Indian Ocean and just imports and stuff. Then moving to Rwanda, it just depends on how you want to live because you could live somewhere in Rwanda and have a decent house for $500, $600 with several rooms and bathrooms in it. It just depends on where you want to live in relation to, let's say, where certain centers and things are happening in a city, but you could do that. Or you can have that same thing somewhere else and be paying $1,200 or $1,000, but you're still much lower. And there's an opportunity to have furnished places so that you're not having to track your furniture around everywhere. And you're still paying in that price range. Outside of that cost of living, I think sometimes foods and things can be harder. Vegetables, being in Rwanda, that has been amazing. Just to be back somewhere where there's a lot of farmers because there were vegetables and farmers, place you can go to the farmer's market type of thing, to the market in Mauritius. But here there's so much more of that because agriculture is so large. Fruits and vegetables and produce is a lot less. Then there's other things that are imported, especially if you want the things that you're accustomed to that are being imported. And those things are really expensive. And because of that, things kind of balance out, but it's just all about how you want to choose to live your life and spend your money because you can do it much less. And then you can do it at medium or you could be spending a lot more because you're getting more of those things that are imported or you're going to this nice place. But Even eating out here at the nicest places is still so much less than you will ever pay at a comparable place in the U.S. for the same quality and all of that. I was curious to learn more about Rwanda and Kigali, about the infrastructure, the culture, the government, and the people. Rwanda has very good infrastructure, especially because I'm in the capital city in Kigali, Roads are very much paved here, especially in the city, and they're constantly paving more. Rwanda actually has super high levels of internet in comparison to the rest of the continent and a 4G. We have a fiber optic connection. You'll have moments where sometimes something's going on with your internet and then you're hopping on one of your WhatsApp groups and you're like, hey, does anyone else's internet have an issue today? to figure it out there might be something going on but no different than you would if you were sitting in any other city anywhere else same thing in mauritius internet was pretty good but yeah penetration of internet here is like a 4g network is even it's high transportation here there's moto taxis which people call motos um, which motorcycle taxis that you can hop on and off of there are cabs i would say rwanda is really dope because there's apps for cabs. Yego has the thing app on for Android, but you can just call this number. You tell them where you're at 
And then the driver calls you back and you get an SMS text, a regular text message that tells you what your driver's name is. It gives you a code. And when your cab comes, you give them the code and they put it in. So we didn't have anything like that in Russia. You can order most of your groceries online here if you choose to. You can go to the market and have go. So you, you can have your choice of which you want to do, but the possibility is there. We have local equivalents of what an Uber Eats is. We have a couple of them here. Other forms of transportation, obviously there's walking, which I love, and it's very pedestrian friendly here with so many sidewalks and things. And you will get your workout with the inclines. And the hills, it is definitely land of a thousand hills. And then the last thing is the buses. There's the city buses and there's kind of also the, the Matatu buses that come. But the city buses, they don't look too much different than the buses in New York. They literally have the names of where they're going scrolling across the front. There's tap and go. You have to buy a card and then you load money onto it. And then you tap and go. A topic that has come up on several episodes of this podcast, particularly pertaining with Blackness and on the continent of Africa, I wanted to know Autumn's experience being a Black American in a Black country. I wanted her to tell me more about perhaps the identity and the politics of Blackness as she's experienced it in Rwanda. Being a Black woman from the U.S. and a black woman who my identity is very rooted in my blackness and how I walk through the world and living here in Rwanda oftentimes because people have not lived within a certain proximity to white supremacy with the exception of people in South Africa on the continent. Sometimes there's just that analysis around how we identify with our identity <laughs> it was very difficult. It was very eye-opening and difficult. And the fact that you're still just seen as this outsider and I think people have one experience in one place and then they think 54 countries are going to give them that same. They're somewhere in the islands and they've had this experience in this black majority country or brown majority country. And they then feel that's going to be that same experience. When we talk about just being a black person and a black person from the U.S., what does that mean to one? And it means so many different things. And that experience and how you've related to it throughout your life. But then also, how do you travel with that? Before we even talk about moving, how do you travel with that? Because I see so many examples that I felt are highly irresponsible or where you're just perpetuating the quote unquote American stereotype or tropes and whether or not it's entitlement or the, how you just want to pose on things or who and what you take pictures of and how you use those images. Even as a Black person from the U.S. and the consciousness and awareness and accountability or responsibility around that. So I think that's the first thing because to be conscious of that within travel, because if you aren't, that's the same thing that you're moving with when you relocate to somewhere. I am now in this, yes, majority Black place and Black African country, and there's so many amazing things that are happening here now. Such an amazing place to be. But then oftentimes, because people do not understand the racial or socioeconomic structures and stratospheres of the U.S., they just see you as an American, period, 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 period. It does not matter if you identify as Black American, African American, New African, African in America, or any one of the many other political identities. That was very difficult for me, <laughs> very difficult. Because the other thing is, is when someone asks you, are you American? Despite your personal feelings around the country, and I'm very clear on my political feelings around that question and what black people, our relationship has been to that country and around or lack there of choice around that identity and but then also just being clear that this is not a time for me to take up space and make it my moment to explain and do this teaching thing around this is how I feel. That's not that moment. How do you cope with that? How do you learn to accept that? And for me, I would just say, I'm from the U.S. For some people, they might just not. Some people may take up the space and want to explain their much longer thing. Or they might want to say, but... That's not the moment for it. And that goes back to space and how we enter into space the same way that we look at how 
white people enter into space and how men and everyone else with privilege enters into space because we do have a privilege when we come to this continent. Our passports carry privilege. And at some point you decide to accept that. And it's a completely different thing from going from being in a country where you are regarded in large part at being at the bottom of the totem pole to living in places where because of your passport, because of the fact that you're likely going to make more than the top 10%, 2%, 5% of the country just because you are a foreigner and the skills and things, you have a whole different standing and that is completely different to what you are accustomed to having in the U.S. So there's many layers to it. I say that to say many layers. I think now, and it's interesting because I thought just even from traveling that over the past years with Black Lives Matters, with a hashtag being large in the news and all of the police cases, murders having been highlighted in the news, that people had opened up to it. But I'm realizing with recent events of 2020 that it's still very new and people still hadn't seen that. And at times it has been really frustrating in conversations um, where people still just don't get it or they'll be like, yeah, some really strange things happen. Some of it is language and just understanding and exposure and just being aware that even though that yes, things are still have lasting marks of colonization here. People may feel that people who've been running their countries and who at times have made bad decisions or that decisions that were not in their interest are people who have the same skin tone as them. And so it has been definitely the hardest piece of adjustment as that being seen as other. Also, I think just in terms of my experience as a light-skinned black woman with curly hair and depending on the length of my hair, when I'm walking around, my hair is longer and it's huge and big and fluffy curls. I have felt at times is totally different than my friends who come with different texture hair and who are darker skin. And that was also something that was hard, not hard, but it was also something that I accepted. I am not gonna, may not have that moment of people really being, hey, and thinking I'm from somewhere that other people love when they feel that they have when they go to different parts of the continent. As far as womanness, I think the biggest thing I would say is that the difference in street harassment being much less, much, much, much less than being in Chicago and New York and just the U.S. in general of being in Mauritius. I still remember the first time I was walking down the street and a guy in a car actually said something out of a car to me. And that was probably the only time. And here in Rwanda, funny story. I was walking down the street not too long after we moved here. And so I'm crossing the street and there did just there wasn't a lot of cars coming, but I wasn't thinking, oh, maybe that's because the street was closed because it didn't seem it was. As I'm, so I'm kind of walking in the middle of the street where there's an opening across and this truck is saying something to me, the guy out the window. I will ignore you if you are trying to give me street harassment. I will just ignore you. I will act as if you do not exist and make you question your existence. I'm just going to keep looking straight forward, not even turn. I'm doing this to the guy talking out the window because that's what I'm accustomed to in the U.S. At some point, he hops out and then I realize, oh, this was a motorcade that must have passed and this must be the trailing end of it because he's in a suit and he's just, oh, no, I just don't want you to walk in the middle of the street. It was kind of just more of out of that kind of feel. Just don't walk down the center of the street in that way. And it's so funny because I go in afterwards, I was actually going to, to my husband's job and I go in and I told him, I was like, yo, I'm so used to street harassment that I automatically assumed that him talking out of the car, that's what it was. I was just ignoring him, not even realized this is the back of some diplomat's delegation because the delegation had already passed. And that wasn't the only time that that's happened. It's been other times where I've been walking down the street and Men have been trying to tell me maybe a couple of times the flashlight on my phone is on. And I'm just so accustomed to in the U.S. that if you're making sounds and noises down the street, that that's what it is. That was the most eye-opening thing to me. And literally here, I've maybe had two or three times at the most three where someone has said something as I'm walking down the street that was street harassment. 
That and there's not the same sense or awareness around personal space in many countries around the world because it's a very cultural thing and it's very heavy in the U.S. That said, there's a lot less of it here and in many places in the world, there's a lot less of it. And for me, it would be very uncomfortable, especially when men are very close to me, just because of experiences in the U.S. And then the last one that is related to that is that people stare here a lot more than what we are accustomed to in the U.S. And when I first got here, I, you can just imagine, particularly men staring at you with long stares, how that felt coming from the U.S. Just from the history, just from men staring in that type of way is usually, I can feel it burning through my body. And it just feels someone's just looking at you in that historical experience of it in the U.S. <laughs> as women. And when that has happened, I had to really adjust from that. And so many times that happened and my husband, would be, they stare at me too, or it was just kind of people looking and that part of it being that you're not from here, but just culturally that people look more. But that was the other really huge thing. Being in Rwanda, because of the history of Rwanda, there are a lot of people that lived outside of Rwanda in the diaspora, be it in other surrounding African countries, in Europe, in Belgium, London, various places, but also in Canada and the U.S. that there's, and there's been a lot of Rwandans who've come here and moved back to ancestral land. And so that made it a little bit interesting because you have people who have lived abroad and so you kind of identifying on those experiences as well as the traditional cultural experiences here what I have found as a woman that I have loved and cherished is that being able to sit down and have conversations whereas before my home girls might be from Brooklyn Chicago New York LA Atlanta DC wherever maybe Dominican Republic, but being here that now my homegirls are from South Africa and Nigeria and Ghana and Morocco, so many different places. That has just been beautiful in so many places on a continent and on earth. And that when we have certain conversations, it is the same things that we laugh at (laughs) as women, as black women from different places. It is the same things that we have in common. And there might be places where there's differences, but it is beautiful to explore those differences and to say, oh, well, this is how our parents say that. or This is what our parents said growing up. But it's just amazingly beautiful to see our similar responses to certain things and to be reminded of that connectivity that runs through us as Black women all over the world. I asked Autumn to describe to me the origin story of her company, Kigali Forward. When I first got here, I was going to take a hiatus. That lasted a few months, and I started getting into doing some events. A friend I have in South Africa who used to live in New York needed something done in Rwanda and contracted me to do that, which, side note, I will say... Once you move abroad and really start getting in those communities, you will be amazed at how many other people live abroad (laughs) or other friends will start thinking about moving abroad or going abroad. It's kind of when you get a car and then you start seeing your car everywhere, you start realizing how many people you already know that live in other countries and how much people move around. And your circle just starts to be way more global than regional or local. And so, yeah, we happen to be on the continent did that and that just reawakened me to wanting to do stuff. Overall, when I first got here to Rwanda, I had already read about Uganda, which is the collective work day that happens once a month where everything in the country shuts down until 11 a.m. And the reason is, is because there is collective work of might be clearing a field, it might be helping to smooth a road, but literally you as your community does that together and you're expected to be there. Everybody who's basically 18 to 65 and there's nothing that's open except for hotels, everything else, because how can you be at work if you're supposed to be doing your community work? Let's alleviate that problem, keep stuff closed. And I had read about that and just loved it in the essence of it in terms of 
communal politics and things that I believe in politically. I already knew that it was one of the like cleanest and safest places on a continent and in the world for that matter. The, the highest number of women in parliament globally and has had that for many years. I had read about these things, but then coming here and experiencing them, totally different, totally different. Just being able to see them was amazing. Being able to see Car Free Sunday that happens every other week, twice a month, year round. And then being able to see the president out sometimes working out with the people. That was just amazing. When everyone's talking about building green cities. And now this is happening and it's just amazing. See that happening here and the vibrancy of it inspired me. And I was like, yeah, I did not get this full narrative together. And I don't feel other people are either. Because many people will still make the ignorant jokes around, oh, I knew around Hotel Rwanda, or use that as a reference point, or they know the gorillas, or they might, at this point, it's been popping up in the news a lot more, they might know one cool thing that happened here, but not the narrative of this whole thing. That just as someone who does communications, brand marketing, PR, we need to tell this story. We just meaning people, period, and people here. And how do I use my experience to be able to provide some of that for what's happening? Not to come in and take that over, but to provide platform skills. So I built a company, Kigali Forward, as a mission-based PR marketing brand agency. If we're looking at the issue being the fact that the narrative is very limited, then how do we look at a, a creative solution for it? And how do we approach it as a social entrepreneur that's solving for something and as an impact entrepreneur and using marketing as a tool to do so? And that is what the company is built around and being able to do that and basically be able to expand and shift the narrative and being able to tell the stories of Remarkable Rwanda, the brands that are doing the work here, the organizations that are doing the work, the events that are happening that do tell that narrative. I asked Autumn to walk me through the process of registering a business in Rwanda. Rwanda is the second easiest place on the continent to do business. Shout out to Rwanda, and you can literally start a business online in a few minutes. It's that simple. I went in because I had a couple of questions, but you can't, and even that, you just go in to RDB, to development board, and it's literally that simple to start a business here. And that is, that's one of the huge things that Rwanda is known for, is that it makes doing business, and it makes starting a business very easy. Mm -hmm. And just support around it, the fact that the different government agencies are very accessible. There's an American Chamber of Commerce here now for people who are from the states, who have U.S.-based businesses or businesses here that have large people from the states, amounts of people from the states working for them. You can join American Chamber of Commerce. You are able to get information and be able to talk to other entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs from the states. But early on, there was a Kigali Entrepreneurs Group I found on Facebook. When I was thinking about starting my company, I started going, they would have lunch once a month. And it was people from everywhere and people with all different types of businesses. When I would go to lunch, if you had a question, you would kind of just throw questions around if people were had a question around taxes or something else and just being able to meet up with other entrepreneurs who are here. As a fellow plant-based shawty, yes, I am a plant-based shawty, vegan. I was really curious to know what the plant-based scene in Kigali was like and how Autumn came to be a part of the plant-based scene in Kigali. Afia Organics is the first plant-based restaurant in Kigali in Rwanda. And my partner, Sitra, she had already started it long before I got here. And shout out to her. When I got here, I'm vegan and have been for many years. And we moved here in June, June 1st. And I was guess this is going to be the first year. I don't have a birthday cake unless I make it myself. And I found a Kigali vegetarians group when I first got here. Joined that, asked on there, and everyone was, oh, you should go to Afia. I went there, she made my first cake, and just got to know her more and was going there more. I was like, okay, this is amazing. I want to help and support. Became a small partner through investing. She does all of the day-to-day -day things around it. 
it's, it's catching on more and people are definitely opening up a lot more to just healthy options here. Even as people who were not maybe thinking about it as much before around getting a juice and not just a fruit juice, but a vegetable juice or a smoothie. Those things, the same way they're catching on more in the States, are doing so globally. So that has been interesting to watch. I'm vegan for health reasons and I'm the natural person. I don't preservatives, not trying to use the thing that is turquoise blue to clean my house or anything else because why is it that color? Why does it smell that way? What is that? I need to know what's in my things. But I'm also not going to sit and make everything. Actually, now, yes, we are making a house cleaner because I can't get any Dr. Bronner's because I can't travel anywhere. But that part has been difficult from cleaning with hair care products and stuff. There's limited stuff in Mauritius as far as hair care stuff. And in Rwanda, there are a few people that import shea moisture. And there's another place that is known for its natural hair care products. And they have stuff. And I've gotten actually some couple of good things from there from Ghana that they've had it. What's hard is some of it is inter-Africa trade, where you still get the high vat. That can be harder sometimes than trading from outside of the continent. That's one thing that I know is a constant conversation. But then, yes, on the other side, you are starting to see more brands here, people making things. There is clay here, naturally, in one of the provinces. And so there is a soap brand that I've started buying locally that is clay-based. And it's made with local things. And starting to see more of that and more entrepreneurs here with the oils and different things. So that is making me excited to be able to get it and to be able to um, support local entrepreneurs, especially local women who are making products and to be able to have you know the quality. I think some people sometimes feel, oh, you move to this place that's outside of the US and everything is gonna be all natural and it's gonna be super easy. Nope, mm -mm, not everywhere, not the case. Or sometimes people are just getting into using some of those natural products in one way or knowing that other people outside, they might use it locally, but knowing that other people want to use it to the extent at which we do. I'm excited to see that there are a lot more of those small companies that are popping up here that make face stuff. There's two places here I love, two women that have companies here I love that make face oil serums and stuff. One from Nairobi that lives here and one from here. Yeah, there's more of that happening and I'm loving that. I was curious to know the Rwandan response to COVID-19 and what was Autumn's impressions of the government's response? They have done an amazing job, just very swift action, super, super swift action. Before there were even any cases, about a week before we had any cases at all, they started putting hand washing, portable hand washing stations out at high traffic areas such as bus depots, markets. And yeah, mainly places like that, but other high traffic areas as well, so that people will wash their hands. Across the continent, there was a huge campaign around just washing your hands and how to wear a mask properly. This was before it really arrived here. And then when we got our first case, it was on a Saturday. They announced it in the morning. By that evening, they had closed. This was middle of March. They had already closed all the churches and put out that all schools would not be open for at least, I think it was like four weeks initially, churches, places of worship, none of that would be happening. That was the first day of one person. <laughs> it was such a different <laughs> response than what I had seen happening in the States and in a lot of other countries. And I was like, yep, that's why I messed with Rwanda. <laughs> it was so vigilant. And obviously, because you have people, you have systems that don't have the same level of infrastructures. You don't have the same number of hospital beds. You have people that are living in closer proximities in certain areas. We have a lot at stake, as did many countries who did not respond as swiftly. Anyhow, that was on Saturday. As the week went on, it's just there were kind of things happening day by day. By Wednesday, they made an announcement that the airport would be closing down to all commercial flights on Friday if you were planning on leaving, that you needed to book your flight. And that was within less than a week. By the Saturday, one week to date, by around 7, they put out an announcement that as of 11.59 p.m., we would be expected to be in, in our homes unless we were out for the mandated reasons to be out, the grocery or essentials, the grocery or medical. It was just such a different response and vigilance around it. Our numbers were able to stay low for very long. I was curious as to how Autumn and her husband's relationship has evolved by living abroad knowing that the first time they've lived together was living 
outside of the United States, far away from hometowns, friends, and family. And I wanted to know how that has affected their relationship. It's been interesting because I've had a lot of friends say the hardest part of marriage or adjusting is the first two years or three years. We definitely, as I said, did stuff at a different pace. Essentially, Mauritius is one of the top honeymoon locations, destinations in the world. We spent our first year or nine months of living together in Mauritius. <laughs> that was a much more chill pace. And I feel like it's just different than not being in the States, not grinding. Also, just the just mental wellness that you deal with in the States around that grind factor, around the racism, all of those other things things that come with it, those things affect you personally. And what affects you personally affects your relationship. When you're constantly going out battling that as a Black woman and your partner is going out and battling that as well, that's a lot to bring home. Not to say that you don't bring other things home. That's a lot, though, to bring home and to care for each other and love each other through. And we don't talk about that a lot in relationships, but it is. I think having a relief from that has been able to just enjoy life together more has been, it's a gift, it's a blessing, and I appreciate it. Not to have some of those other pressures on when you already have many other pressures on in life. It's so just the regular things that you deal with. I have really appreciated that we've had this time away and to be able to incubate the beginning of living together and partnership away and outside of that. I asked Autumn to share some advice for Black women that are thinking about moving abroad. I am committed to the fact that we truly do change the world by shifting narratives and by expanding that and taking that into our hands and doing that ourselves. Everything from showing that Black women are courageous enough and do move abroad. We are out here helping Black women who have thought about it and those who have never thought about it see the possibilities in it and see beyond perhaps what media has presented to them or what ex experience has presented to them as what is possible and reminding them that we are infinite and that we are everywhere. I think that my biggest piece of advice would just be just go open-minded. Do not have expectations. I mean, that's kind of a rule for life. Do not have expectations. When you have expectations, you create the, your own sense of what you think your reality is going to be and then you're going to see what reality is. So, don't just don't do it. <laughs> Avoid it. And just go with an open mind without expectations. Research. Look things up. Or if you have the opportunity to visit somewhere first. But don't go with expectations. Even if you visited somewhere for two weeks or if you've been back and forth to somewhere, don't have expectations when you move there. Because, again, living somewhere is completely different. And even living somewhere two, three months is completely different than when you're talking about long term. Down to small things, you might have things that you're used to having from the States and you bring those things with you and you still have them for two, three months. It's different when you're there for a year and that place doesn't have them. <laughs> and it's something that you're really accustomed to having and you run out of it. That's a very small, small issue or just thing that can get to you when you're first away. I mean, there's way larger things for sure. I also asked about her definition of wellness. Wellness, I think the biggest thing for me, especially as a city person, especially as a Chicago, New Yorker and a go-go personality wise, the biggest thing for me has been just slowing down. Marisha slowed me down tremendously because it was island vibes. And because it just wasn't, nightlife has not been the same in either place as what I'm accustomed to in New York. You can go out here in Rwanda and you can stay out until early morning. It is possible and you can do it. But there's obviously just not as many options as things to do. But also I'm coming from big cities, number one, and I'm a very active person. I'm always going to find something. I think that it has slowed me down a lot. I'm sitting on my balcony now talking to you. We have three balconies in my apartment. And I'm sitting on a balcony and listening to the birds and the trees. This is where I sit and do my press pitching and write media releases and things. It's such a different life. Like I have a hammock. I've had a hammock in both places that I like lay in in the mornings when the sun is rising. It's, it's such a different pace of life. And I, I really appreciate that. And I know that I needed that. That was an incredible story, Autumn. Thank you so much for sharing. And if you want to keep up with Autumn, you can follow her via her social media. You can find me on Instagram at Iamstagram. It's just I-A-M-S-T-A-G-R-A-M. So 
and so think I Autumn Marie and the rest of Instagram. And you can find me on Twitter at Miss Autumn Marie, M S Autumn Marie. Thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode. And please leave a five star rating and please leave a review of the podcast. It would mean the world to me and will help the podcast be found. Also, if you are a blogger or if you know of a blogger, please go ahead and pass this podcast along to your blogging and writing friends. I would love for Flourish in the Foreign to get featured in more publications so that more people can really celebrate these voices and these stories. And if you are a woman of color and you are a podcaster or you're thinking about becoming a podcaster, I highly recommend joining the WOC Podcaster Insiders Membership. Yes, it's a membership that provides a wealth of information on how to get guests on your show, how to monetize your show, and how to increase listenership of your show. I am a member of this membership, and I think it has been super helpful and really interesting for me. So if you're interested in becoming a podcaster, please consider joining the WOC Insiders membership, and please do so through my affiliate link. Yes, this affiliate link helps to support this podcast. So go ahead and do that. The link is on the website. The link is in the show notes and on across all social media. So you will not miss it. Thank you to Zachary Higgs who produced the music of this podcast. If you are looking to create your own podcast or maybe a YouTube channel or you're about to drop your new mixtape, you definitely want to hit up Zach. He is an incredible musician. He is an amazing artist and producer, and you definitely want him to help you get your project to the next level. So hit up Zach, tell him I sent you, and the link to all of his information is in the show notes as well. All right, that's it for this week. Definitely check me out on Instagram, at Flourish Foreign. I've been featured on YouTube channels and in different Facebook groups and in workshops and stuff like that. And I actually have a lot more really interesting things coming for y'all. Some really cool stuff. So you definitely want to get plugged in. Follow the podcast at Flourish Born on Instagram. So for this coming week, I would like you all to take the time to journal. A few of my guests that have been on this show have really sung the praises of journaling and how journaling has helped to clear their mind, but also help them manifest the life or the goals that they've been really desiring. So this week, I'd love for you to take 30 seconds to 30 minutes to sit in a quiet space and to write your feelings, your thoughts, emotions. It can be stream of consciousness. You can write a novel. I just want you to take this time to honor your feelings by giving them the time and the space and recognition they deserve and by putting them down on paper. Honor them. See what you have to say. Oftentimes, we think we know what we're feeling, but it isn't until we create this space to allow ourselves to be fully expressed that we actually know how we're feeling maybe even what we want to do next. So take this time out this week and journal. Like I said, 30 seconds to 30 minutes, stream of consciousness to the next great novel. I just want you to give yourself this time because you deserve it. All right, until next time, please take care of yourself. Bye. On the next episode of flourish in the foreign oh god that was such like a manic last day silly me <laughs> decided to still work that day and I, I still had to pick up my passport oh my god the worst because they it ended up being held up at the vietnamese embassy longer than i intended and then go back to work i was late to my farewell party said all my goodbyes, then decided I need to get my hair braided <laughs> because I was like, I, I don't want to manage my hair while I was abroad. I made it to the airport, 
So by the time that I got on that plane, I, there was nothing but relief that somehow this had all come together and worked itself out by the grace of God. 